Maybe you started out in a big church, mega church, and uh, you've always known big churches, but I didn't start out in a big church. Uh, my mother had a pretty big church that we went to when we were little kids, but I consider my conversion to radical Christianity at the age of 26 um, involved a small country church. I was the only white person at this church that was made up of African Americans, and the patriarch of the church was transplanted from Mississippi up to Michigan. Can you show my little time travel thing there, Dan? I think it was the first slide on mine. Yeah. And so I go all the way back to um, 1984, God was uh, getting a hold of me, and it was uh, uh, actually 1982, uh, around Easter time, I went to an Easter service, and I got to hear a special song on that Easter, but I didn't really give my life to the Lord, but I started paying attention to some things, and then I got a hold of a Bible, and it was a Bible from one of the cult groups, the New World Translation, but you know there was enough of the real Bible in there that I was uh, paying attention to some lifestyle changes but I didn't really come to really convert to Christ until a few months after that even though I was uh, cleaning up my life on the outside somebody had to take special attention and that's my testimony tonight uh, the person who led me in a sinner's prayer probably just helped me understand that I could say I'm saved and I know why I'm saved, and I can repeat this, and I never have to doubt whether I'm saved. Because he really showed me in the scriptures how to know that I know that I know. And I did those things. Um, I responded to Christ the way that you should when he offers you the free gift of life. I didn't reject him any further. I accepted it, and I prayed and asked him to come live in my heart and to guide me and to teach me, and I asked him for help. And Asked him, uh, I just repeated a lot of cool prayers that this pastor led me in. And it has really worked. I haven't doubted my salvation since, since then, 1982. I haven't doubted the existence of God. He gave me faith. But that wasn't the church that I went to. I only went to that church a couple weeks. And then I went over to the House of Prayer, Church of God in Christ, House of Prayer. And my pastor passed away um, just the, the last year. Kathy and I were walking alongside the uh, American River, and my phone worked up there, and I got a phone call, and one of the brothers said, our, our father passed away, wanted you to know. What a blessing that I get to carry on the best. Sometimes I would show up for Tuesday night church, Wednesday night church, Friday night church, and when I would get there, the time that the sign said church started, there wouldn't even be this many people there yet. On Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, Sunday night, we held church every, every one of those nights. Tuesdays and Fridays, we would fast. And we would open up every public service with a time of testimony. And maybe the pastor hadn't even arrived yet. And maybe some of the others hadn't arrived, but somebody would be given the responsibility. When you get there, open the doors, turn on the heater. Just a small little house in a neighborhood that had been turned into a sanctuary. Got that heater cranking, and even in the midst of the Michigan winter, real hot in that little house. And somebody would get up and say, okay, we're going to open up our time for testimony. And then he might share a testimony, or she. And then the little children would come up. They would be encouraged by their parents to get up and give a testimony after they had gotten saved. Because you really don't have a testimony before then. But I would hear the children sometimes start out this way. I thank the Lord for being saved, baptized, sanctified, and filled with the precious Holy Ghost. Amen. And then go and sit down. The next one come up. I thank the Lord for being saved, baptized, sanctified, and filled with the precious Holy Ghost. You might know a song that I wrote that has that as the co chorus. I'm saved. I've been baptized, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. The um, first verse that I have there is our biblical rationale for what we're going to do tonight. Yes, I'm going to share the word because some feel ripped out if the professional clergy doesn't give us a, a scripture from the word. They don't realize. When I first came to Bell Road, I actually heard someone say to me after a few weeks, when's he ever going to preach a sermon? I thought, come on, there's been lots of preaching. But because I didn't have the robe on or the suit and the tie or whatever, because I didn't stand still and read a text and give three points, it was like, man, they wouldn't. that same person wouldn't have understood that Jesus just shared a sermon. Well, I thought he was just talking to us. He interpreted the Word of God. Now this right here gives us a biblical rationale when we come from all different walks of Christian experience. Man, that, that little Church of God in Christ, House of Prayer, 
it was um, probably sometimes smaller than that gospel lighthouse you guys spent so much time at. You might think, how, how could it be smaller than that? But I remember showing up for prayer meeting, and it was just me and another guy for prayer meeting. Me and the pastor's son. When's everybody going to show up? Oh. We are everybody. Yeah, we are it. We're two or more are gathered. But this it comes in 1 Corinthians 14, and you know what happens in 1 Corinthians 13. It's all about love. And even if I have this gift or this gift or this gift, I can do this, I can... All these things, if, if love isn't at the base, then it means nothing. But that comes after 1 Corinthians 12. It's talking about all these spiritual gifts and, and the possibility that one might think that one gift is elevated over another. And in all this context... We come to chapter 14. You know, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter has been sandwiched about spiritual gifts and individuals in the body of Christ and the possibility that one might think their gift better than another. Love has to be sandwiched between chapter 12 and chapter 14. But reading from chapter uh, 14, verse 14, Paul says, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Now, some could say, oh, tongues, that's, that's what Alicia does. She's learned Spanish, and she's a missionary. But Paul's speaking about ecstatic utterance that is not a known language, as far as I'm concerned, because he says, as far as I understand this, he says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my understanding is unfruitful. This is an ecstatic utterance that you may or may not have experienced. Paul says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I say with my heart. It might be your song language. It might be that language when it's just you and God and you're out walking in the woods and you know, you might just be whistling and that could be for you a, a language of angels. A language nobody else really understands. And you couldn't even put it in words. But, you know, when I'm whistling, someone goes, Oh, you must be happy. And I hadn't really realized. Uh, you know what? I guess I probably am pretty happy. Because it's a melodic tune. And I haven't thought, Oh, I'm happy. I'm going to express myself. It's Oh, someone just, Oh, oh, was I whistling? Whistling while you work? Singing in the shower. Not necessarily. Singing in the shower might be the same thing. Paul might say, I sing in the shower more than you all. <laughs> look what he says here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And here's where you might be thinking of two aspects of what it is to be a human being. To be the heart and to be the mind. To be the, the heart and the head. And in in any home, maybe the, the husband is the head. And I'm talking logic and left brain thinking. And, and the wife is the intuitive one, the right brain, and the heart. Oh, Kathy's got such a heart. You know? And sometimes in the church, you've got the, the head people are running the finance committee and the nominating committee, and they're sorting everything out according to some sort of reasoning and logic. And then there's the mission committee that's saying, hey, let's just do this thing. God will provide the finances, you know, the heart. Sometimes rules over the head. Sometimes the head rules over the heart. But, you know, we need both. And Paul says, within myself, I've got this head knowledge. I've got this head kind of prayer. I can tell God, oh, Lord, will you do this, this, and this? I can make my petitions and my requests and my intercessions known to God. But then we follow the Lord's example. But, Lord, not my will be done. Let your will be done, whether it's the way I'm praying for my head, the way I'm praying for my heart. Paul says, if I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, and I'd say my heart prays, but my, my mind is unfruitful. I don't really understand, you know, I can't really voice exactly what it is that I'm praying about. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. Now, you know, someone say, oh, that Kyla, she must be a Pentecostal because she's doing all these hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo's all, you know, in between songs and stuff. She does little things with her voice. You know, you know what that might be? That might be her heart praying, mm -hmm. her heart singing. Oh, yeah. And it's not necessarily words, but it's just, you know, it's a melody that's coming out. And it might be kind of hard for us to follow, but if we say, hey, she does that, 
I'm the left brainer, she's the right brainer right now, and we're doing both. I'm praying, I'm singing, and the church, we're singing with our mind, we're singing doctrine, we're singing from the hymnal, and we're singing with our heart. Paul said, I will sing with the Spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? There comes a time when you do need to have somebody open the Word of God and say, okay, let's just read the Word so you can say amen. How can the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't understand what you're saying? For you indeed give thanks well. But the other person is not edified. Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. You know, now I was at a charismatic service once with this girl I was dating, Kathy. And... I had to draw the line at the point when the guy was playing the organ and then the, the associate pastor got up and said, uh, brothers and sisters, you know, he, he just did a, a long organ solo and I have the interpretation. And then he went off in King James English that there was an interpretation for the people of God. The, the man was playing in tongues. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know, I think there's a little flaky here, Kathy. But... Well, you know, when John's playing a, a guitar solo and he's expressing himself with his heart, well, maybe we shouldn't go f so far as to say, oh, God wants to get a message to us. So that someone, he, if there is a guitar solo, there must be an interpretation. But maybe we, we might interpret it this way. Okay. Is he giving the best that he has to give? Did he work hard? Is he just saying, okay... When they, they built the tabernacle, one was given um, the gift of craftsmanship, gold workers, woodworkers. They brought the best they had, and they had skilled craftsmen whom the Spirit had endowed to do this work. And so a choir that has really worked its craft and can sing that four-part harmony, they've got that shifting tone that just makes all the difference. Is that just a bunch of flakiness? That uh, Oh, we, we don't need that. Let's just... You know, there, in the old days, there was a time when the hymnal was viewed as vulgar. It wasn't, didn't have a place in the church. Piano was a vulgar instrument. Bass, common. Didn't belong in the church. There was a time you'd, you'd think, oh, the, the good old hymns. No, the good old hymns were vulgar at one point. They weren't considered important enough to be in the public service. So what we consider traditional is not all that old. So when Paul says, you know what, I can express myself. Here, I might, I might say it this way. Instead of me personally saying, I speak in tongues more than you all. I could say this. I can do country church more than any of you. I can do big city church more than any of you. I can do prayer meeting more than any of you. I can do all this kind of stuff more than any of you. Because I love church. My wife and I, we love being in the house of God. We can go to the country church. We love it. We can go to the Union Gospel Mission. We love it. And, you know, it, it, Paul has already said at this point, but if I do all that or I say, all, if, I, if love's not at the center of it, you know what? It doesn't mean very much at all. In fact, he says, it, it means nothing. And so maybe we say, Paul says, I would rather speak five intelligible words. God loves you very much. And then I sit down, more than a thousand words. Or if I can't do it, Maybe I'll sit and listen to somebody else say it. How is it then, brethren? Uh, verse 26 of that same chapter. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm? I think in experiencing God, that, that um, study many of you went through, it was a 12-week intensive study. The question was asked, in your church life, where is there the opportunity for the church to be the church? For us to hear one another. Well, if, if all your church experience is, is an hour on a Sunday morning, or a Sunday school class, or we do it in our small group. Yeah, but what if, what if the idea of small groups is, is only you know, like 7% of the, of the total church population? 
Is that sufficient? I think that little country church I first started going to, they had a good thing going when they were teaching the children how to testify. When you come together, each of you has a psalm. That would be, you know, and sometimes that testimony, someone would just stand up and start, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. We didn't have hymnals. We didn't have overhead projectors. We didn't have rehearsed band. In fact, they put me behind the piano and I had to figure out what key sister so-and-so was playing, was singing in. And eventually, you know, for the most part, those songs are very predictable. She's either in G or A flat. She sticks around there when sister so-and-so does it, you know. And the pastor played little cymbals. And the children had tambourines. There was no rehearsed band. The choir was it. The choir was rehearsed. But worship went on a long time. It was wonderful. And when I went to the white church later, and I'd talk about how cool my church was, oh, I, you know, and worship leader said, you know what, Rob? You're not in the black church anymore. <laughs> this isn't it. If you love it so much, why are you here? Why aren't you there? Yeah, I guess you're right. God had me there. But we can't forget where we came from. Amen. And so when you come together, you know, not that you have to have one every time, but Somebody might have a psalm in their heart. And, and Rena had one today. It was spontaneous. She said, I've been thinking about turn your eyes upon Jesus all week long. I said, okay, let's do it right now. Patrice, find it. And we sang it. No rehearsal. That was the church being the church. She brought a hymn. She brought a psalm. And maybe one has a teaching. And I know Wolfgang's prepared to share something tonight. But you know what? Time, if we said, we didn't announce that it, it's going to end at 7 today. Because, you know, Kyla said, well, I just, oh, Lord, I just want to sing this chorus one more time. You know? Oh, if she were watching the clock, we'd say, sorry, you can't. Time's up. It was only four songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, when John does only four songs, he knows how he can slip a little medley. And right. he, can, he can stretch four into seven. Right. Hey, you know how to do it. Yeah. All right. But, you know what? I think that anybody who wants to leave at seven can leave. But I'm going to stay. Because I love doing church. Amen. It's even getting a little hot in here right now. <laughs> it made me feel right at home. If you have a psalm, if you come together, one has a teaching, one has a tongue. Now, you know, today I, I did tongues. I did, oh, how I love Jesus. But I gave the interpretation first. Oh, how much... I love Jesus. <laughs> and one has a revelation. And, and that might be, you know, I, I, this is obvious. Maybe it's obvious to you, but I never saw it before. It's like, boom, rev. I got a revelation today. Something really cool happened today. I want to hear stuff like that. When you come together, one has an interpretation. You know what I think is happening here? I, you know, there's an interpretation of an experience. Um, because we have a Sunday night service, a member of First Baptist Church is here tonight because he couldn't make it to church this morning. Mm -hmm. So how do I interpret this experience? It's what Shannon was praying a while back. Oh, Lord, would you just get the word out that, that there is a place for the brethren to gather across denominational lines? On Sunday night, we can come together. Maybe the, the brother from First Baptist Church would have a word for us tonight. Would that be okay? Amen. So let all things be done for what? For building up. Paul said, you know what? If, if I want to sing in the shower in my unknown language, 5,000, 10,000 words, I can go for it. But you're not going to be edified. But in the church, whether it's me or whether it's Scott, Shannon, Kathy, Judy, five intelligible words that's going to build somebody up, that's what Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. That's what it's all about. That's what the church is. This is the New Testament church. Next. 